Hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of Contagion. My name is John Parkinson and I'm the senior editor. Joining us today is Dr. Scott Sigmund, fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and is affiliated with Lowell General Hospital in Massachusetts. Thank you, doctor, for being able to join us today. Hey, John, can't thank you enough for having me on. Thank you. Let's jump right into the topic. For those not familiar with your case study, can you take us through the patient presentation, treatment, and outcome? Terrific. So this is a 57-year-old African-American patient who presented to our hospital with severe COVID-19. Uh, he was admitted, then brought to the ICU on six liters of oxygen. Uh, they elected to not intubate him. Uh, he was was then transferred to a monitor floor, uh, and that's where we were able to meet him for the first time. Uh, I'll give you a little background. It's a, it's a little interesting in that I am an orthopedic surgeon, uh, yet I am here as a principal investigator uh, for an IRB-approved study on COVID-19 pneumonia, so we can get into that as we get going. But when we first met this patient, he was quite sick. He was uh, failing to thrive, was unable to get out of bed and ambulate, had just finished uh, or just failed a physical therapy appointment. Uh, and then that's when we had signed him up for uh, the first inhuman uh, uh, trial of, of the use of photobiomodulation therapy, also known as laser therapy, uh, for COVID-19 pneumonia. And uh, in terms of the treatment and the outcome, can you talk a little bit about uh, those areas? Sure, absolutely. So the treatment is was done in the hospital. Uh, this uh, patient in particular was part of a uh, a small uh, pilot a randomized trial, which we are still uh, collating the data at this point. The, the study has been completed, but it's four once daily consecutive treatments of photobiomodulation therapy, also known as PBMT, uh, 14 minutes to each lung field, uh, and then that's four days in a row, and then that's when the treatment ends. And it's pretty profound, you know, to be perfectly honest, this is the first time that we were treating a patient. I was not sure what to expect. As an orthopedic surgeon, I used PBMT for acute and chronic orthopedic uh, conditions in my laser clinic, and we found profound improvement in acute inflammation within orthopedics. So if you had a really bad ankle sprain, for example, and you had profound swelling uh, and bruising, if you use the laser, it's almost 100% efficacy. And that was the thought process for me to say, what is, what is COVID-19 and ARDS? It's acute inflammation of the lung that's gone haywire. So I wondered if it was possible that we might transition care to, to COVID patients. So we didn't know if this was going to work or not, and it was really you know, quite profound. We brought our team together, uh, who were nurses and staff from around the hospital. We downed our PPE, and we went in on the floors to, to treat these patients. And literally within five minutes of treatment, you can actually see the pulse oximeter increase on the patient as they're going through the treatment. They will actually tell you they feel better as the treatment is happening. At the end of his first treatment, this is a man who really couldn't eat well, was not able to ambulate, sat up, and I'll never forget it, you know, as I was worried as to whether or not I was going to help a patient, he sat up and said, hey, doc, is it okay if I order a strawberry milkshake? And so, <laughs> you know, so I would say that his first treatment went well, and then we proceeded over the four treatments. He had a, a really pretty disruptive cough when we started. By the third treatment, the cough had stopped, and at the end of the fourth treatment, the following day, he was able to do a physical therapy uh, clearance within his room, was transferred to rehab. We have x-rays pre and post immediately treatment, which show a significant improvement in the ground glass opacities over the four-day course. We have C-reactive protein levels, which show a dramatic decrease as well, immediately pre to immediately post. And then all of his pulmonary scores, we use the covid Brescia score, we use the SMART-COP uh, score as well, where we analyze the predictability of outcomes in the setting of, of COVID-19 pneumonia all had uh, dramatic improvement from pre to post treatment. So we recognize this is one patient, but as authors of this study, we felt that the, the way in which this patient improved in particular, we wanted a conversation to get started about a non-pharmacologic treatment that's safe and could potentially be effective and hopefully trying to really encourage other researchers and clinicians out there to perhaps uh, start this, this trial in a larger randomized controlled trial so we can truly uh, decide whether or not PM, uh, PBMT is a good supportive treatment for COVID long-term. Very interesting, and it and sounds like it was an excellent outcome, definitely better than what you had expected going into it. And tell me a little bit more about uh, the laser therapy and in terms of a little bit on the technology and how you came to understand it. So that's a great question. So the laser 
laser that we're using is a multi-wave locked system. It's MLS. It's manufactured by Asa Laser, ASA, out of uh, Venetia, Italy. It's distributed out of Cutting Edge Laser here in Rochester, New York. And the laser itself is a, is a dual diode laser. We use 808 and 905 near infrared uh, wavelengths. It's synchronized so that the lasers are pulsing on and off together uh, despite the two different wavelengths. We can uh, generate penetration of photons and laser energy to about four to five centimeters uh, below the skin. Uh, we aim the diodes 20 centimeters above the skin. This is a mobile scanner, which is also great when it comes to laser. There's no contact to the patient. Uh, basically, the scanning device moves around and above the skin, which is great in the setting of COVID, obviously. Uh, and uh, it generates uh, 75 watts of peak power, which really helps to generate uh, a significant amount of photon energy in a smaller time window. Uh, what's great also is because of the pulse technology of the laser, the tissues never, never get above three degrees Celsius. So you don't have to worry about skin necrosis, thermal necrosis, or complications. You know, most people think of lasers, we think of cosmetic and surgical lasers that generate high heat and peak power that then sort of destroy tissues in a controlled fashion. We're not destroying tissue here. If anything, we're creating a healing response that creates a vasodilation that occurs. Uh, the laser has been well studied in basic science. It shows that there's a decrease in inflammasome formation, which is a protein that sort of helps in the cascade of this ARDS. And, and what it does is sort of down-regulates the production of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, and that's what really turns off. We're not, you know, patients are not dying of the virus. They're dying of the response of the body to the virus. And so we can block that ARDS and cytokine storm. That's when we can, that's how we sort of help people. If you think about it, you know, we're, we're people on a planet that has a sun and we have sunlight. So it should not be a surprise to individuals to know in the deepest part of our genetic code that there are proteins and molecules that respond to light. And that's what happens with this laser at the cellular level. Increases mitochondrial production of ATP, ATP binding proteins, reduces the inflammasomes as we talked about, and then downward trends the, uh, the pro-inflammatory cycle. So that's the sort of the basic science, which is really well proven within the literature. The clinical studies are lagging, especially obviously in the pulmonary field, uh, but there are studies that have been done on humans for COPD and asthma. So there may actually be even further indications for the use of PBMT for pulmonary in, in humans. Absolutely. And, and you had referenced one of my questions, which is this idea of, you know, taming down inflammation. One of the things we're finding with treating COVID is the earlier we can begin treatment to better tame down that inflammation and avoid the cytokine storm. Uh, the better off the outcome is for the patients so that they won't become more severe or in worst case scenarios, um, die from their condition. Are you finding this to be true? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what we're, that's, that's our goal and what our aim has been. We, we would, you know, in a perfect world, having completed this pilot study, hopefully we'll get a larger randomized controlled trial, but it would be really nice to have have these lasers even in the emergency room upon admission to the hospital, immediate COVID testing. They, we, we're finding the patients are, are sick. We can start the laser treatment for them, you know, immediately. It was interesting, you know, again, as an orthopedic surgeon, I was using laser for hips and knees and ankles and things like that. It was, it was a difficult task for me to decide what the dosage would be uh, to be able to determine how we we're going to do this. Uh, fortunately, I was able to get on ResearchGate, so I know that we, we probably have some people out there that are familiar, but basically it's a LinkedIn for researchers across the world. And, and I was able to find two doctors, Dr. Sohaila Mukmali and Dr. Mariana Vetri out of Canada, who are literally just writing a paper. It's total serendipity. We're writing a paper on the theoretical use of PBMT for COVID. Uh, I was able to DM them. I sent Dr. McMully my, my laser parameters. She called me back 45 minutes later. She gave me the dosage. I plugged it into the machine and it worked as far as the, the parameters for the laser. So, and that is all included in the case report. So we've been published on the American Journal of Case Reports, peer reviewed at this point for our first patient. Uh, our next patient actually uh, is another case report that we've actually submitted for peer review. We're hopefully gonna have that uh, published relatively soon. And then we have also completed the trial at this time. We're putting together the data there and our plan is to present uh, or at least submit those 10 patients to the New England Journal of Medicine once the uh, manuscript is completed. Wow, that's, that's great. That's uh, excellent news. And in terms of your second patient, were they in a similar situation where they had COVID-19 and pneumonia? Yes, this is another patient with severe COVID pneumonia. I can't 
quite talk about it yet because we're in submission state at this point. We're hopefully, you know, be able to do that. But yes, this is another patient that had uh, additional comorbidities, a younger patient, but also had severe COVID pneumonitis. And we actually have even more inflammatory markers that are, are showing improvement as well. So we're, we're really excited about that. I can tell you, you know, it, it, was not, it was not easy sort of getting this study off the ground. I, I, I went to the you know, institutional review board at my hospital with the idea of thinking about how we might do this. Uh, they got back to me and said, well, that's great, Doc. We appreciate the fact that you know a lot about laser, but we don't. And so we're going to need some guidance from the FDA. So I said, okay, that sounds pretty easy. You know, we'll just, we'll just call the FDA. And we did. And quite remarkably, they called us back six hours later. Uh, we then, you know, in the setting of this COVID, all of the, the standard uh, paperwork and bureaucracy goes out the door. And they were genuinely you know, excited to be able to help us to see if we could, you know, go along. So over six days, we sent them the specs of our laser, and they got back to us to say that we were a non-significant risk device, which gave my IRB the comfort level to approve the study. So there's so many parts of this, you know, to, to be able to do a new treatment for a patient that's never been tried before. Uh, you know, we're still getting a lot of naysayers out there. Not The good news is most of the the, of the feedback we've been getting from researchers, doctors, et cetera, has been positive. But, you know, it's one patient. We understand that. But science doesn't start unless you try it. And so we've got one patient. We've got two patients. We've got 10 patients. And now we need to, to move forward. So I'm hoping and really appreciate, John, that you're having me on here so that we, we can get some people out there that are listening, that are researchers that might stimulate some interest so that hopefully they'll pick up the baton and be able to continue this study. Absolutely. And doctor, you had mentioned that uh, you obviously have had experience with this on the orthopedic side. Uh, have you seen any kind of side effects or anything with uh, performing this therapy? Great question. So MLS uh, laser has been FDA uh, cleared now for over 10 years. There are no reported incidents of any complications associated with the laser. The only issue is for darker pigmented patients, uh, the, the laser will not penetrate quite as much. So we have a button on the laser that basically reduces the intensity by 50%, and then it recalculates the dosage and then goes ahead and lasers as well. So we would just make you know, people aware that, that but the pigment button is available, but there are no known registered complications, again, with the associated use of this, which is why it's so amazing, right? If you think about all of the pharmacologic treatments that have been tried so far, you know, some have worked, some well, some haven't. You talk about complications and other effects. You're talking about laser light energy that's safe, may show, you know, true efficacious results. Uh, so the question is, why wouldn't we want to study this further? Why wouldn't we want to sort of progress the science? Mm, absolutely. And you had mentioned earlier that um, you had talked to a another physician about uh, looking at the treatment and, and what you should be using. Do you have a uh, treatment protocol at this point for using it? We absolutely do. And that, you know, the idea is we want to spread the science. And so there, there is great news. There are actually two large uh, cohort studies that are being performed right now that we are aware of, one in Brazil uh, and one in Russia. They have not been published as of yet, uh, but we understand that the results have been favorable. So we are excited to get that information. We want to make it perfectly clear that you know, this is, this is public information. The exact protocol for, for the laser, for the dosage uh, as well, is all uh, uh, laid out in the case report on the American Journal of Case Reports uh, so that, you know, certainly uh, if you have a laser that's available, uh, you can certainly have that availability. It's difficult for me to comment on any other laser other than the MLS. That's the laser that I use. That's the one that I have experience with. So we can certainly talk about the results of the MLS laser, but I think that uh, there, there are a number of, uh, of research groups around the world that are working towards a similar goal. Sure, absolutely. And I guess one of the things that, you know, kind of um, is important to speak of is with this particular case study that we're speaking of here today, was it something where the patient uh, was getting worse? Was, there, was there, their condition worsening? Or, you know, why the decision to use the laser treatment in the first place? So you know, it was fascinating. When I went into the hospital, again, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I don't really, I'm a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. So the world did not need a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon in, in the middle of this pandemic. And in Massachusetts, it was pretty bad. You know, we were early hit uh, and the hospitals were full. We had hundreds of patients in that were COVID positive. And the morale around amongst the hospital 
and we had amazing staff, doctors and nurses, but the morale was super low. I mean, you weren't doing anything. We were treating our patients with oxygen and you were watching patients die. So there, there were not a lot of you know, remdesivir, you know, uh, the malaria agent, they were out, they weren't really being used. So there was not active treatment. And so this was sort of a ray of hope that we brought the laser in. Uh, this patient in particular, you know, signing up your first patient for any treatment that's ever been tried is not necessarily an easy conversation, right? I mean, I could, I could bring no, I could bear no experience to the conversation other than to say to him that I believe in the laser using for acute inflammation of orthopedics. And this is my hope that it will work for you. The patient was so appreciative. He was just so happy to know that we, that we cared at this hospital, at Lowell General Hospital, to provide these alternative options. And he signed on the dotted line immediately. And, and like we said, I mean, we know, we know him well, and he's doing great. He's home. You know, he's, he walks a mile a day. We speak a couple times a week. We've become, you know, sort of close friends because of, you know, our camaraderie over this event. And uh, so he's, he's done exceptionally well. So yeah, he was, he was stagnant. He was, this was a patient by all, if you look at all, again, reading the case report, we dial in, you know, the, the potential outcomes that are associated with his level of disease and he could very well not have made it. And so, you know, it's hard to say that you, you definitively saved someone's life, but you know, if you truly look at his parameters, he was on the edge for sure. Absolutely. And lastly, doctor, you know, what are you thinking? I know you mentioned a couple of things that, you're looking for this, for the technology, but what do you think are the next uh, steps for this technology? I, I could envision three specific ways in which we, we could use laser for COVID patients in particular. So the first is what we've just done. Let's get a large randomized controlled trial on patients that have severe you know, COVID-19 that are showing significant symptoms. Let's see if we can treat them. Let's see if we can prevent them going onto ventilators. As we all know, if you go onto a ventilator, your outcome is potentially very poor. Uh, that's number one. Number two is, wouldn't it be interesting to try a study within the ICU for the patients that are already intubated uh, and see if laser treatment might shorten their course of intubation and be able to get them off a ventilator faster? And then the third and final way, which I think we could study this, is that there's a lot of, of, of post-COVID disease out there, and these patients are lingering and really having a hard time thriving. So they've survived, they've lived, but they've had significant pulmonary damage. They're having a hard time breathing, uh, and they're not getting around very well. I'd love to do a study on those patients to see if we can improve their pulmonary status after severe COVID as well. So those are the three ways in the setting of COVID. Then I think you can talk about studies for COPD and for asthma, et cetera, using this sort of God-given anti-inflammatory, you know, using light rather than pharmacologic treatment. Absolutely. So it sounds like there's a lot of potential applications within COVID, but also other pulmonary uh, illnesses as well. Absolutely. Great. Well, doctor, thank you very much for taking the time to discuss this important topic. John, it was a pleasure to be on here. I really appreciate the opportunity to share our story.